Um, yeah, so what we I want to do next is um, give you a little bit of a rundown on what's happening in the Burdekin Basin. I notice that John Connell is on board tonight. John's a, a volunteer and management committee member at um, Queensland Conservation Council, North Queensland Conservation Council in Townsville, and we've been collaborating uh, on uh, issues related to dams in the Burdekin Basin. So before we get started, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, how do I do that? Uh, where are we? Safari, that one there. Share that. What is that one doing? Righto. So here we go. Uh, let's just uh whoops so let's just so this is the queensland globe i don't know if anyone amongst the people online here use this fantastic tool that the queensland government uh, makes available where you can um uh look at geographically related information everything from traffic counts on roads to uh, locations of mines uh mining leases uh, exploration leases to native title uh, determinations, to um, uh, things related to tourism and uh, the economy. So anyway, this, uh, this map that I have put up on my screen shows uh, the, catch, the major catchments that are around, that feed into the Great Barrier Reef. One of them is the, uh, the, the catchment of the Burdekin River, which uh, just sort of pointing out with my cursor here. That's, um, that's a big river that if you've been to Townsville by road, you cross over that giant uh, metal bridge over the, over the Burdekin River, just between air, uh, between, um, air and home hill. So it's, uh, it's that massive river that flows out to the, um, uh, to the ocean, uh, just off shore there and uh, is, sort of one of the sources of the sand replenishment for the Cape Bowling Green Spit that um, protects the Cape, Cape Bowling Green uh, Ramsar wetlands. But anyway, so here's the, here's the Burdekin uh, Basin, the, uh, the second, the largest river system in Queensland in, by volume, as far as I understand. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, the amount of water that moves out of the mouth of the Burdekin River uh, is about 60% of the size of the Murray Darling. So it's, it's, a, it's a big river. Uh, it, it, it carries a lot of water. The, um, unfortunately, even though the Burdekin uh, is only the one big dam in it, that's the, the, uh, the um, Burdekin Falls Dam uh, just near um, Collinsville. Uh, or inland up up the river, you know, and it's it's the largest dam in Queensland. The um, in Mackay, we've been campaigning for a while about the proposed Urana Dam, which I'll just show you where it is. That's it there. Uh, it's west of Mackay, on the on the Bowen River, on uh, the Bro Broken River. Uh, just well, actually, that's a little bit misleading where that location pin is, but it's it's there's the Urana Creek, there's the uh, uh, Massey Gorge, and this dam, if it went ahead, would flood uh, that creek right up to the the Youngland uh, National Park and into the uh, Massey Creek up into the gorge. Two beautiful places uh, in Queensland. Let's turn off that. Um, that for a sec. So yeah. So uh, you know, th there's that dam is uh, would be the second largest dam in Queensland if it's constructed, and we've been working hard to to stop that going ahead. In addition to the uh, to the Urana Dam, there's also a proposal to increase the height of the Burdekin Falls Dam, uh, which is get that. there it is. Uh, so just scrolling around this map again. Um, so the Burdekin Falls Dam, the existing largest dam in Queensland, the, uh, there's a proposal by Sunwater, a government-owned uh, business corporation that uh, wants to increase the, the height of the dam by two to four, six metres, which would uh, increase, the, you know, increase the storage, 
and reduce the flow downstream um, from, from the dam and exacerbate problems like uh, erosion of Cape Bowling Green Spit. Then, uh, not only is there uh, those two dams, but, you know, but there's more, as they say. Uh, so there's the, the Big Rocks Weir is proposed near uh, Charters Towers. It's a small dam uh, to provide water for, uh, I think, urban and, um, and agricultural use, but John can probably uh, provide more info about that in a sec. I'll, I'll just, at the end. And then we've also got um, uh, the Hell's Gate Dam, which is uh, a huge dam proposed in the upper Burdekin. So you've got the Burdekin River flowing along here. Uh, and Hell's Gate uh, will, will suck in all the water in the northern section of the Burdekin River. And then uh, the plan with that, this is the one, the Bradfield scheme that, the, um, that Pauline Hansen's really keen on. And the uh, plan is to uh, send the water inland around Hewenden. Uh, and so, you know, like what we're looking at is a huge number of dams on a, on a system that is mostly unregulated. Uh, the Bergen Falls Dam does a lot of damage to the flow of the river downstream. Um, but uh, it's, you know, like there's, there's significant, um, there would be significant impacts, especially if all these dams went ahead and the cumulative impacts would be, uh, would probably lead to no water flowing down the river. But if there is any, don't worry, there's another project proposed to suck, put a straw in there, like a big, uh, you know, uh, Fifth, uh, half meter pipe uh, and suck water out and send it down to uh, Bowen and the various other horticultural areas along the way. So, uh, yeah, well, look, so going back to what Mackay Conservation Group, I suppose, is mostly concentrated on the Urana Dam. Um, could uh, just turn on, yeah, so this is the layer in the Queensland Globe of coordinated projects. So Urana Dam, uh, they haven't actually, well, surprisingly in this, they haven't put in all the detail, but the uh, Urana Dam here is, uh, would supply water to these, these proposed private ir uh, irrigation areas downstream from the dam side. Also send water across to the, um, to uh, the Adani's port at Airlie Beach, at, uh, sorry, no, Airlie Beach at um, Abbott Point, uh, and send water inland uh, to the coal fields. About 30% of the water would go inland to the various different coal mines in uh, the Bowen Basin. But, you know, I th the, there's probably not a really big demand for water in the Bowen Basin, but there's probably a demand for water in the Galilee Basin. Uh, so it's likely that that's another source of that, that water. So, you know, I think just to give you, an, anyone who hasn't seen this site, um, to give you an idea of what the reason why we're, we are um, campaigning to protect Urana, uh, some like some of the, it's just the beauty of the place. So this is, uh, these are photos taken by Jeff Tan and others up at Urana. Um, that's an Irwin's turtle, one of the a tur a species that is endemic to the um, 25 square kilometres of stream downstream from the, the dam and up into the Urana Creek, and Massey Gorge probably as well. Uh, and it was discovered by uh, Bob and Steve Irwin in 1990 uh, and that you know, it's a unique species that has it has the capacity, has the ability to breathe underwater. So it sucks water in through its cloaca, which is it's sort of like it's in its bum. It's got a um, uh, like a lot of orifices in body in in living things. You know, that serves more than one purpose. So can lay eggs, defecate, and breathe through there by sucking water in, running it across membranes like gills, and it, it extracts water. But it requires really clean water that's fast flowing. So it's got lots of oxygen in it and it's clear. And then this turtle can spend like, I don't know, uh, Jason Schaefer at um, James Cook Uni uh, did a research paper on that a few years ago. And I think they could, they'd spend 
you know, uh, uh, at least 45 minutes underwater, but they could spend hours underwater um, without, you know, without surfacing debris. So that gives the turtle the ability to forage and helps them survive if they, if they are um, able to breathe underwater. If you build a dam, it'll make it more turbid, like so the, the, the Burdekin Falls Dam is full of really cloudy water that was never there before. Um, it's just the accumulation of all those little clay particles that never settle out. They, they, they're, they have um, an electrical charge on them, so they, they bounce around uh, being repelled by water molecules. So there's always these little, these, these particles of clay in the, in the Burdekin Falls Dam that were never expected to be there at the time when the dam was built. Uh, they, that, that, that cloudiness of the, of the river, of the dam, uh, was un completely unexpected but now when you look downstream of uh, the dam the water is always cloudy because that's the sort of water that's being released from the dam itself uh, we'd see the same at, and probably up at uh, uh, Urana if that happened uh, if the dam's built so these are just more photos of the uh, the beauty of Urana and why we think that sorry I'm just um, what am I doing here yeah I'll just slip forward I don't know why um, yeah, so there's, uh, that's Ken Dodd. He's a witty man uh, who's uh, very concerned about the construction of the dam. And the, I was speaking to him today and uh, he said, look, the, the witty, uh, the, who the hill people uh, around that area and the Biri, Biri uh, mob are, are definitely against construction of the dam. Um, and, you know, they, they want to see their country and their human rights protected. Um, the, yeah. So these are just more photos of. Oh, some of them make a lot of little toys. Ah, uh, it's yeah. it's such a you know like it is a beautiful river that is being um, the proposal you know the proposal to build a dam on this you know is uh, partly being sort of pushed by people who try to claim that it's just uh, uh, it's not it's it, it's it's clapped out cattle country. Well, you know all these photos show you something completely different. Um, what we're doing, and one of the things that I think that would be really good uh, and a learning from the Adani campaign is for us to um, approach potential financiers for this project. So Urana is a private dam, so it would be constructed using private money and owned, the waters would be privately owned and sold by a private company to, uh, to farmers and others at a profit, no doubt. So it's, they're gonna need a lot of money. It's gonna cost over $600 million to build a dam. Uh, the proponent is probably looking for a handout from the taxpayer for that. Uh, they've already received you know, $27 million to do feasibility studies for the project, which we've had them anal their preliminary business case analyzed and it showed that the dam would only make 26 cents in the dollar. Uh, you know, so it doesn't make any business sense from what we can see. Um, but that doesn't stop people going ahead uh, trying to build it. And the, but what we, I just came across the other day was a, a recording of um, one of the, the, the executives of the company that's proposing to build the dam. And he was saying that he was in New York approaching finances and listed a whole bunch of companies. So um, there's um, JP Morgan, uh, there's uh, Weir, I think, the, an investment company, JB Ware, I think, uh, investment company, and a whole bunch of others. And I think that following along the same lines as the Adani campaign is, we should just write to the environment officer of each of those companies and just ask whether they're aware of all the environmental and social justice issues around this dam. And uh, is their company planning on investing in it? And then do the same thing with the banks around Australia and insurance companies around Australia and superannuation funds around Australia. So it would be really good if we could get some people to assist with that um, because, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of work and, it, and there's a lot of work to do in this campaign. Um, but that's a really important piece of work that we need to do just to determine whether these companies they may come back to us and say, yeah, we're, we're thinking about putting money into it. And then we go and you know, try to build a campaign around that. What are the main arguments that the um, pro-dam builders are using? That's helping the farmers, that it's going to be good for everybody because we're doing this for the farmers. Yeah, okay. That one. Yeah. 
Uh, I'll just turn my script here. Yeah. Uh, look, um, I think that. Yeah. So one of the things that's come up is uh, so um, John, uh, especially, is he's on the um, the committee of the um, that's uh, looking at the raising of the Burdekin Falls Dam. And it appears that especially the leadership, well, definitely the leadership of the farming communities downstream from the dam, uh, from the existing Burdekin Falls Dam and downstream from where your honor would be as well, uh, uh, don't want new dams. There's enough water there. What they want is water efficiency. They, they think that it would be better to put government money into making it more efficient to, to, to use water, and which reduces the runoff to the reef which costs them less and, you know, has, has a lot of benefits. So that, that brings up, brings me to my question that yeah. I've been wondering about for a long time now because, mm. you know, I'm just a simple, simple girl. Um, what uh, dams, like, I grew up thinking dams were great, you know. Um, everybody knows how good dams are because they bring you water. What's the alternative? And when you say water efficiency, what do you mean? I mean, yeah, okay. what are the terms? Yeah, okay. Well, look, um, so in terms of in uh, the Burdekin, the way that the irrigation of the cane crop is currently done is like they flood irrigate. So they take big pipes, they pump water, and they run it across the ground. Um, the... Um, the proposal is to use like overhead spraying, uh, which would be, you know, it puts the water in the right place. Like the other proposals like uh, you can put down polymers uh, that are uh, degradable on the ground and prevent evaporation. You can irrigate every second row of crop rather than every row. And so, you know, using half as much water, the plants, still get it, yeah. you know, like, so there's there's a whole bunch of techniques that can be used to make uh, irrigation more efficient uh, and then use less water. So it's estimated that they can save, so there's, um, you know, anyway, probably almost as much water as is in the current Urana, in, in the proposed Urana Dam uh, would be saved through efficiencies and allocation of water that's already in the Burdekin Falls Dam without construction of a new dam, new high dam wall. So, and then, you know, like, and with climate change, uh, there is increasing evaporation occurs uh, and- uh, Yeah, so, so it's likely that the dams won't fill because they evaporate more quickly. Uh, and also you have longer dry spells, bigger, more harsh dries, hotter temperatures, it, we may also get big cyclones, but maybe the dam can't hold that capacity for too, you know, hold that water for too long. So, you know, there are a whole lot of issues around projections, you know, like a lot of these things are based on historical data when what we really need to be doing is projecting using the best modelling available about climate change and determining whether or not these are really suitable projects or should be, we be working towards farming and living in a more arid or unpredictable climate. Okay, um, so has anyone got any questions or anything for me about the Urana or the Burdekin Falls or the Burdekin or anything like that? Yeah. I've got one question about the So this is Len, yep. Um, the, how much of the water that is, that the uh, dam hole now, that's the Burdekin Falls, how much of it's used each year? Does anybody know that? I mean, that'd be an important thing for me. If thinking of my farmer days, mm. you always like to see the dam full mm. and you didn't like to see it empty. I just thought, does this Burdekin Falls dam ever get empty? Because when you look at it on the map in its position, if it's got plenty of water in it, it could go to all of those places just about that that they want to build another dam. It, yeah. like, so the Burdekin Falls Dam uh, supplies water to the mines, like through to Murumba, like there's a pipeline. Yeah. There's uh, there's uh, water um, that there is around fifty thousand megalitres 
per. Well, I can't remember that. Oh, look, the numbers can be used. Yeah, yeah, there's, the numbers there's, a, there's a huge amount of water that's available uh, each year that isn't allocated. No one wants it yet. Mm -hmm. No, it hasn't. So it's available. Mm -hmm. uh, what the, you see, you know, those are the sort of figures that I think you can shock the public with. If they think 50% of the water in the Burdekin Falls Dam never gets used, immediately if I'm a person, uh, citizen, and I'm going to fork out money to build another one. I'm going to say no way. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Yeah, okay. Well, that's an interesting thing to keep on board. So we'll, I'll look into that. And I'll t and John, do you know that that off the top of your head, John John Connell, are you there? Uh, in in the lower Burdekin around Home Hill and Air, uh, that there's two main irrigator groups. The what's called the Lower Burdekin, which is the old delta. And most of the farmers there pump water out of the ground from the ground water and put it onto their fields. Uh, they have a problem of uh, replenishing that water from the Burdekin to stop uh, seawater ingressing and contaminating their water table. So they still use water from the Burdekin. Um, the later group which really depended on the building of the Burdekin Falls Dam is called Briar Burdekin uh, River Irrigation Area and, and they pump water out and then let it flow onto their fields. In that area they have a water table problem which is exactly the opposite that all that water is causing it to rise. Both of those groups are concerned about water table issues and actually want water efficiency their allocation of water, I think, is about 650 uh, megalitres a year, of which they use between about 40 and 50 percent themselves. So they, they don't need more water in that area. Um, they may need less. And so, in fact, if they're going to deal with the water table issue, they're actually looking for ways to have water efficiency, which is what uh, Peter was just talking about a little, a few minutes ago. This is less. So they're looking at how to reduce their water use in some places up to 50% or at least uh, about, only about 70%. So one of the big alternatives is instead of building a new dam is to actually modernize the whole irrigation uh, precinct down there to have it delivery system more efficient, to have it automated uh, so that they can apply the water just when the crop needs it. And that would also give the farmers flexibility. It would save them huge costs in, in pumping, in electricity. They would use less chemical inputs. And so there would be fewer inputs going out onto the reef. And so yep. the reef regulations would be something they would be able to comply with very, very easily. And sort thanks. of yeah, putting that would be lower, less cost than building a dam. Dam construction, water, private water for private people. Who's, who's promoting it? Oh, yeah, look, so there's a bit of, there's a lot of political, you know, dams are very popular politically, as you, as, you know, people have recognised, you know, especially in Australia, you know, people think that dams are a, uh, you know, like, uh, always good. So there's there's a lot of, but um, I just wanted to just, like, just remind people that we're sort of like, we're running up against the clock. Uh, so we've, got, we've got, still got, Ruth's got a question in the room, but uh, there's also one online from Carol about the, um, whether this dam would affect the platypus at Yungla. Um, the Irana Dam won't. It's, uh, it's a lot dip way downstream along the Broken River from uh, Yungla. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a different part of the catchment. I, I just want to say there was a man at a recent meeting about Irana, and he said that the silt in the Burdekin um, ruins the machines out at the mines, the pumps out at the mines, and he's right. saying that's why the water is not, um, they don't want the vertical water, they want 
Yeah, they, 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 yeah, they want nice clean water. Some more water. So yeah. It didn't matter how much volume there's in the burning, and they weren't wanting that. Okay. Yeah, like, you know, anyway, the, the, the mining industry probably wants nice, clean, fresh, crystal clear rainforest water, but they, they, they don't want to pay for it, though. You know, like, so it costs around $700 million to build a pipeline for them to do that. So, anyway, look, uh, we might just like leave that there now, but I will send out an email uh, to people saying, you know, the, amongst the other stuff that we're doing about uh, Adani, you know, what you can do to help uh, if you want to get involved in this campaign to protect the, you know, the biggest river system in Queensland and, you know, one of the biggest in Australia. Um, I think the second largest in Australia, but it's a, you know, it's, it's really important that we protect our rivers. There are, there are, you know, like they save, serve so many functions and they should, you know, they should have a right to exist.